Extend. Yep. Okay, yeah, so I, I'm going to give uh, what I hope is a nice, easy introduction to DAG based consensus protocols. Um, so I think most of the talk won't be that technical, uh, but this being a tutorial, I'm going to go through like a couple of proofs. Okay, so there'll be, there'll be some parts where some concentration is required, so please do like, pepper me with the questions. The more questions, the better. Uh, in fact, I think I'll, I'll finish early if there aren't enough questions. Okay, so don't, don't worry about slowing me down. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so we're going to talk about DAG based consensus protocols. I guess the, uh, the first natural question, and let me just minimize that so I'm not seeing the slides, uh, is so what is a DAG based consensus protocol, right, and why, why might we care about these things? Uh, so I think it's safe to assume everyone knows what a blockchain is. Okay, so obviously in a standard blockchain, uh, the way it works is the blocks, uh, at least the blocks that count, right, the blocks that actually have their transactions executed, is all in a sequence, right, with each point pointing to the last one. Okay, uh, and in a protocol, let's see, I have to get that to go forward. In a protocol like Bitcoin, uh, forks do occur, right? But ultimately, only one side of the fork ends up counting, right? In the sense that only one side of the fork actually has their transactions executed. Right? And in fact, certainly in the context of Bitcoin, forks are seen as being a bad thing, right? Basically, forks uh, threaten security. And so we actually have to slow things down and slow things down quite a bit, right, in order to prevent them happening too much. Okay, so on a very sort of basic level, a very sort of simplistic thought is, okay, wouldn't it be great if somehow both sides of a fork could count without threatening security? Right, if we could do that, then we could produce blocks much more quickly. Right, this would be a good thing. Okay, so that's exactly what happens in a uh, DAG-based protocol. Okay, so now blocks are allowed to have multiple parents and multiple children. Okay, and the resulting structure we call a DAG, or a directed acyclic graph. Okay, so a graph is just a bunch of nodes or blocks uh, with edges between them. Uh, it's directed because of the, the edges have a direction to them. And it's acyclic because they're all pointing in the same direction, which means we don't have cycles if we follow edges in the correct direction. Okay, so that's the sort of, uh, the sort of simplistic idea behind it, or maybe a sort of slightly deeper level. The idea is that protocols like Bitcoin in some sense confuse two tasks, okay? So blocks have a dual role. On the one hand, the blocks are used for relaying uh, sets of transactions. Right, on the other hand, they're also used in order to establish consensus on an ordering. Okay, and the idea is with a, with a DAG based protocol, we don't want to let a block's role in establishing consensus get in the way of its role in relaying the transactions. Okay, okay so the idea is so that the, the DAG will just relay the set of transactions, okay, maybe together with some sort of like minimal ordering on those transactions that's required to make sense of them. Right, we need like, at least some sort of audio on the transactions to make sense of them, because sometimes you know, transactions will allow others to be, to be valid, right? even before we start worrying about uh, double spending and stuff. Right, so maybe Alice is transferred to Bob, but only be valid after Charlie's first transferred some, some funds to her. Okay? So we need some sort of minimal ordering on the transactions. So the DAG is just going to convey the, the transactions right, with some minimal uh, ordering information. And then the idea is that we'll be able to carry out a consensus protocol then on the, on the DAG structure to totally order the transactions sort of after the fact at no extra communication cost. Okay, so you're just going to lay the DAG, the DAG will tell you what the transactions are, and then after you've laid the DAG, each individual party is going to be able to take their DAG and run a little algorithm on their own to decide how to totally order the transactions and have no extra cost, right? That's the ideal. Okay, so in terms of throughput here, you've stopped consensus being a bottleneck. That's the plan. Okay, so different, different sort of consensus protocols you run on the DAG might have different latencies and stuff, but you're not getting in the way of the throughput. Okay, okay so to summarize then, so the DAG structure, which could be very efficiently produced, now right, that just relays the transactions with some sort of minimal uh, necessary information on the, the ordering there, before you even start worrying about double spending and that kind of stuff. And then at no or little extra communication cost, we're going to be able to carry out a consensus protocol on the DAG structure, which totally orders the transactions. Okay, that's the basic plan. Okay, so, uh, so now let's start looking at uh, some examples of, of DAG protocols. Okay. Um, so to keep it simple, first of all, so ultimately, like in order to execute general smart contracts, we're going to be ordered, we're going to be 
we're going to need to have like a total ordering on the transactions. But for now, let's start off with a simpler task. Okay, we're just going to implement a payment system. Okay, so we're just going to implement a payment system first of all. Uh, and again, just to keep things simple, let's start off by considering just the, the permissioned case. Okay, so we have a fixed set of parties involved in the protocol execution. So there are end parties. Everybody knows exactly whoever, whoever else is, right, right from the start of the protocol execution. And maybe we'll, we'll suppose we have a public infrastructure as well. Okay. Okay. okay and in fact, so the, the payment system I'm going I'm to present is the one. So uh, Ehud Shapiro only came uh, a couple of weeks ago and gave what I thought was a fascinating talk. Uh, so in that talk, he, he actually presented the, the payment system I'm going to go over now. Uh, so if you completely understood every aspect of that, and I'm sorry for the repetition. Um, I guess personally, I, kind of, I didn't understand all of it until I went back and read a bit of the paper. So I'm hoping it's worth going over it again now. We have a, a bit more time today, so I can sort of uh, spend some more time going through the details. Okay, okay so I'm going to present uh, Udi's system, which I think is a very elegant system. Um, the whole thing I'm going to present works in the asynchronous setting. Okay, so to remind you what that is, that means that so uh, when you send messages, they are eventually delivered, and they can take any finite amount of time. Yeah, and so you, you can sort of think of the adversary here as controlling message delivery, subject to that constraint that eventually messages have to be delivered. Okay, everyone happy with that? Okay, and one other sort of slight simplification here. So generally, when we're talking about blockchain protocols or state machine replication protocols. There's a separation between like, the, the parties who are actually carrying out the consensus protocol and the clients who are producing the transactions. Okay? So here, I don't want to worry about that sort of complication. Just to keep things simple, I'm going to imagine that it's actually that the parties who are carrying out the consensus protocol are the ones who are producing the transactions. Okay? So in particular, that means that the blocks that each party produces that can just be involved with like, including their own transactions. That's not a necessary simplification. We, we don't have to assume that. Okay, I'm just doing that to make the presentation slightly slicker. Okay. okay, so what we have to do is so we have to uh, form the DAG structure in some way, and then we have to sort of think about how we prevent double spending and stuff. Okay, okay so to form the DAG, it's very extremely simple. So we just have honest parties produce blocks whenever they can. Okay, and I say one at a time there. So here I'm allowing that sort of different parties could produce different blocks at exactly the same time. I just mean for an individual party, if they're honest, they'll produce their blocks one after another. Okay, okay so they produce blocks whenever they can, or whenever they like. Uh, and the basic rule is very simple. So when they produce a block, it's just point to all existing leaves, right? Like as seen by that party, obviously. Right? According to the DAG structure they've actually received. Okay, so that's the simple rule. And that's it, okay? So that's, that's how we form the DAG, extremely simple. Uh, so a couple of other details I should add in though. So we're assuming here that parties like, sign their, their blocks, okay? So we can't forge blocks and pretend they're by other people. And we're also, we're not gonna add a block into our DAG until we see the parents of that block, okay? So you're always gonna, you can imagine sort of down with closed DAG structures the whole time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a little terminology. Okay, so yeah, you have to sort of memorize a few definitions as we go through here, I'm afraid. So uh, like if someone does a block with four predecessors, like you save it on the side and say you also sort of let all those yes, four predecessors. Yes, exactly, yeah. 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 Okay, so when a, when a block uh, points directly to another, okay, we're going to say it acknowledges the block being pointed to. Okay, so here U1 acknowledges U2 and U3. With that. And observing is just a transitive closure of acknowledge. Okay, so U observes V, and there's a directed path from U to V. Okay, so U, U1 here observes all the other blocks. Yeah, just, uh, yes, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, well, yeah. One column for each player, it's just a nice way of picturing it. Uh, and then we're imagining sort of time going up the same exactly. Okay, so U observes V just if, you know, if, it's, uh, if there's a path from U to V, okay? Uh, and a basic observation here, so the instructions mean the blocks of an honest party will be in, in, a, in a sequence in the sense that each block produced by P will observe the previous blocks produced by P. 
Because right? each time you're just pointing to the lead. Right? So if you're honest, there'll be no secret in that sense. Are we happy so far? Okay, good. Okay, so if all parties were honest, and this would be all that's required, okay, but obviously we have to worry about uh, people who might be dishonest, right? We're imagining sort of Byzantine failures. Some people are allowed to behave dishonestly here. Uh, so, okay, what's the basic problem? But the problem is that uh, a dishonest party could try to cheat, right, or double spend by producing uh, what you might call equivocating blocks, okay? So these are incomparable blocks where, so each, uh, neither observes the other. Well, okay, um, so no, I mean, like, you, you could just regard transactions as being valid, right? I mean, uh, if, if no one's cheating, then there, there'll be, there's no problem. We're not trying to totally order everything here, right? It's just a payment system. Okay, so what we're worrying about is just that, okay, so we have to worry about people cheating. They might try and cheat by, by producing, like, equivocating blocks. In this setting, okay, because I've said that uh, each party will just include their own transactions and their own block, the general setting is going to be essentially the same, okay, but uh, in this setting, okay, my blocks can include my transactions. Okay. Okay, so how do we deal with that? Well, that's the, the ordering that's given by the DAG, right? So the DAG is giving you this, this, this minimal uh, ordering. So that you'll, you'll put in the, into, the, into the DAG in a, in a, in a ordering that makes so sense. So is there not a total ordering? Or does it matter if there's a total ordering? Well, no, you, you don't, you're not establishing a total ordering, okay. right? So if, if any transaction depends on others, then that, those have to be included amongst the parents of that block. But you're pointing to a lead, so that, that's fine. Okay, uh, so yeah, so how do we do this? It's, it's quite simple. Um, okay, so some, some more definitions, I'm afraid. Okay, so we're going to say a block U approves V, uh, block V produced by P. Okay, if, if, if it observes it, and it doesn't observe any P block that equivocates with it. Okay, so as an example here, so U1 <coughs> approves V. Right, in this case, it actually... It, it acknowledges it, but we don't require that. We require just that it observes it, right? And it doesn't observe this other equivocating block here. Okay? Okay, so that was for blocks. Now we want to extend the definition to parties. Okay, we'll say a party P prime approves V just if some P prime block approves V. Okay, so there's at least one block produced by P prime that approves it. Okay, so this is important here. So in particular, in this situation here then, this means that P4 approves V, right? Even, even though U2, which is a P4 block, doesn't. Right, so U2 is observing both of the, the equivocating pair. Okay, but here, P4 approves it just because there is the P4 block, U1, that, does, that approves it. Okay, we just require one P4 block that approves, that's all. Happy with that? So this would happen only if P4 was dishonest? No, 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 no. Over here, P4 is being entirely honest. They, they produced this block before they saw this one. Later on, they just, they're supposed to they, they point to a lead. Or it could even be that they're forced to, because P2 has observed this one, and then they're forced to point to that lead. OK? I guess in this picture, you two are Yeah. So in, in, so in this picture, I, kind of, I guess that you have an option as whether to point to it or not. OK, so maybe a better picture would be if, if you, P2 had produced blocks that have observed this one and not that one. And then P4 is forced to observe the other, the other block. Okay. Say again, sorry. sorry, sorry. Like if the block, don't say I approve this block, I observe that block. They just have a list of blocks they're observing. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess, well. And they approve okay. them Yeah, I okay. I guess you could phrase it like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. You just, you just point to some parents, that defines the, the set of blocks that you're observing, and then from that, there's a definition of which ones you're approving. Right. Okay. I mean, fundamentally, it's just really just like a DAG, I mean, not, not the same. Yeah. With a labeling of each node of the player. Yeah. And then all of these are just defined. They're 
extraneous definitions on top. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right, so you're, you're not thinking about these definitions. You're forming the DAG, you're just forming the DAG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so we have that definition there. Okay, so, so uh, one party approves a particular block just that they produce some block that approves it, the, the block in question. Okay, so now a basic observation that is that an honest party uh, can't approve two equivocating blocks produced by uh, some party P. Okay, why is that? Well, <coughs> consider the first block by P prime that approves one of those two blocks. Again, it can't approve both at the same time because if it's observing both, right, then it's approving neither of them. Yeah. So consider the first block by P prime that approves one of the blocks. Well, then all subsequent blocks by pre prime, right, they're on a sequence. So they'll also observe, they'll still observe that first block, right? So they can't approve the other block. Right, either they observe it or they don't, but either way, they're not going to approve it. Okay, so honest parties can't approve uh, both sides of an equivocating pair, only one side. Okay, and now basically we're done, almost, right? So we say V is approved by a supermajority if it's approved by N minus F parties. Okay, so N is the number of parties involved, F is our number of faulty parties, which we're thinking of as being less than N over two. Okay, so that's our notion of finality, that's our notion of confirmation, right? We say V is approved by a supermajority if it's approved by N minus F parties, and then we're done, right? So we're supposing F here is less than N over three, what we have now is so two equivocating blocks produced by P can't both be approved by a supermajority. Because otherwise, because then we, if it is, then we have two sets of N minus F parties. Those two sets, just by a simple counting argument, have to have some honest party in intersection. But that honest party couldn't approve both sides of the equivocating pair. Okay, so to recap, so, right, so to form the DAG, it's extremely simple because they have honest parties basically point to existing leaves when they produce a block. A block approves uh, uh, V produced by P if it, if it basically observes it and it doesn't approve any equivocating block. Okay. And then a party approves a block just if it produces some block that, you know, that, that approves the block in question. Okay, and then we, we easily get safety, right? So V is approved by, we say V is approved by a supermajority. It is approved by N minus F parties. It's established as safety because two equivocating blocks produced by P can't both be approved by a supermajority, just by a simple Corman intersection. So, um, what are the properties we're aiming for if we don't want to be We want that when you produce equivocating blocks, they can't both, they can't both be confirmed, basically. Yeah. That's why it's not, yeah, yeah, that's safety. Well, so liveness is, is relevant, okay, so, but it's kind of trivial in this circumstance, okay, so basically what, what you want, I mean, so here, as long as everybody's producing infinite many blocks, if I produce a block, you know, it's part, not part of a equivocating pair, and I send it to the honest miners, then, okay, we're in the asynchronous setting, but it will eventually be delivered, right? So they're producing infinite many blocks, well, and those blocks are pointing to all the leaves, they'll eventually uh, uh, observe my block, and so approve it, because it's not part of a equivocating pair. Okay, so liveness is sort of fairly trivial then. Okay, so I don't know, I, I think that's kind of like an extremely simple, elegant protocol. And I was kind of uh, impressed by how simply that could be done. Uh, yeah, and it's worth not noting also here that you have, this is like a, a deterministic protocol, right, which works in the asynchronous setting. So that might sound sort of odd if you're familiar with uh, results from consensus because there's this... Uh, famous result of uh, Fisher, Lynch, and, and Peterson, right, which says basically you, you can't do consensus in the asynchronous setting in a deterministic fashion. Right? There has to be some sort of randomness involved. So here we haven't got a contradiction because we're not solving Byzantine agreement. Okay? We're solving a strictly rigid problem. Okay, so I don't know. I, I think that's a very sort of simple, elegant protocol. At this point, hopefully you're convinced that DAGs are useful. Okay, that's my first thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. So, okay, so 
the thing is, okay, all of this, I've, I've sort of simplified it slightly. If you want to do it for transactions instead, you can just do exactly the same definitions, basically. And you say, like, one block approves a transaction. If it observes it, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't observe any conflicting transaction. And the same sort of proofs go through, okay? okay. So it's just a transaction level, not the block level. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, so that's the, uh, yeah. Well, uh, so what part of it not solving? I mean, uh, I guess you'd have to sort of come up with a reduction and then see how the reduction fails, I guess. So uh, maybe that's the way to answer that, is it? I, I mean, but Byzantine agreement is a, is a particular task, right? So, okay, if, maybe if you replace Byzantine agreement with, with state machine replication, just think of them as essentially being equivalent in some sense. So state machine replication asks for like a total ordering on, on, uh, on transactions which we're not producing here. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question, right? I think that's a fascinating question. It's kind of, it's made slightly less interesting by the fact that it's quite easy to get a total order. <laughs> so so uh, I think it would be worth really going into that in detail if it wasn't quite easy, so easy to get the total order. But yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, so that's payments. Well, Okay, if you introduce randomness and stuff. I, I'm saying, okay, when I say it's really so easy, why, I mean, okay. Why can you not easily get a total ordering? It's not, I mean, a second. Why well, can you not already get a use, uh, easily a total ordering from what you've described so far? Because different people are going to see different versions of the DAG at any given type of time. So it's quite, it's very easy to take a, like a function that takes any DAG and just like stretches it out into a linear order. But different people are going to see different versions of the DAG at different times. If you just do that simple thing, then you're not going to have safety. They're going to they're gonna see you know, diff different see sequences in their total order. So uh, it's easy, okay, it, it's not easy, I mean, I guess we're going to go through that now, right? So it, it's easy in the sense that there's no extra, like, a communication cost to it, okay? Yeah, okay, I mean, certainly termination is part of it. I, I, I guess we'll see later on, maybe sort of thinking in terms of Byzantine broadcast rather than uh, Byzantine agreement, maybe it's sort of clearer. So there, definitely the termination is the, is the, the thing that's impossible in the asynchronous setting, right? So once you remove the termination or do a weaker version of termination, which we'll see later on, then, then it becomes possible in the asynchronous setting. Right? Well, you're telling us that the, the fact that you don't get a total order is out fundamentally because you're in the asynchronous model, or is it sort of more general? The fact that we can't achieve a total ordering without randomness, that's, yeah. that's true because we're in the asynchronous model. So yeah. if you're in the asynchronous model, then actually you couldn't make the joke if the problem is. Yeah, okay, yeah, so then you, yes, exactly, you have to, in fact, yes, yes, yeah, you wait for the period of synchrony and then you'll, you'll be able to extract the total ordering without randomness. So yeah. the point is in the asynchronous model, like you have some DAG and the canonical ordering, but then you have no idea how long in the future it might be before you get some old block that tells you what the arrangement is getting part of your yes. The naive protocol would just, okay, you could take any DAG and just sort of like, you can just stretch it out. So you can preserve the ordering relation, just uh, add, add in, extend the order. So now you've got a total ordering. And it just migrates somehow. Yeah, it yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you could do that. But then you're not going to have your safety uh, condition being satisfied, right? Because different people are going to see different versions of the DAG. I've seen this half over here, you've seen that half over here. And they're going to be producing a sort of incompatible sequences if we do that. Okay, so we have, we have to go. Well, yeah. and, and you don't know when you've heard of the same set of blocks and all that. Yeah, so on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, so that I'm, well, I'm supposed to be the, sort of the, the simpler, elegant part of the talk. Now we want to go into total ordering part. Uh, so this part, I'm afraid, is a bit more fiddly. There's quite a lot of uh, definitions involved. So again, feel free to make me to go back over definitions and stuff. I hope this part isn't isn't, isn't overly fiddly. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So now we want to we want to uh, extract like a total ordering on transactions. Yeah, I'm going to try and sketch how we do that. 
Uh, and the basic point, as I said before, is, you know, or at least the, the idea is that we can, we can do that at no extra communication cost. We can, because we're just relaying this DAG, okay, and at no extra communication cost, each individual party will just look at their DAG and they'll gradually form the total ordering in such a way that we have the safety condition. And everyone's always got some co compatible versions of that total ordering. Okay, so uh, first of all, we're going to look how co the Cordial Miners protocol does this, okay, and then we'll, we'll also see how DAG Rider works in detail. Basically, it's a fairly sort of similar proof, so it's really just one thing. Okay, okay so I'm going to proceed. So, uh, okay, so first of all, I am going to give the DAG a little bit more structure, okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to divide the DAG up into rounds, okay? Round one, round two, round three, and so on. Okay, and each honest party will produce one block in each round. Okay, and we're going to say that an honest party will produce a block in round R plus 1 as soon as it sees N minus F blocks in round R. Okay, we, we can do that in the asynchronous setting, right? Because you just inductively suppose that everybody's going to produce blocks in round R. Then I'll send those blocks out. Everyone will eventually see those blocks, right? Well, the N minus F of them because the 40 parties might not. Okay, and so eventually everyone will proceed to round R plus 1 and they all produce blocks in that, in that round and so on. Yeah. Okay, so that's the rule. So an honest party is going to produce a block in round R plus 1 as soon as it sees N minus F blocks in round R. Again, F is the number of 40 parties. Okay. And the rule is, well, basically the same rule as before. So the block produced must point to those N minus F blocks in, in, in round R that you've just seen, uh, and also any other leaves from, from previous rounds. Okay, so basically that's the same. It's just all, all the leaves, basically, right? Okay. So just make it explicit that it points to those N minus F. Yes. So, yeah, we have rounds and the rules as to when you proceed uh, to so between them. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, so we go, uh, so if party two, let's say so here we've got, uh, so n is five and f is one. Okay, so we're waiting to see four blocks in, in a round before we proceed. So, we, if we suppose party two here is just see these four blocks, okay, then they'll produce a, a new block that points to those, but also there's this leaf down there, so they'll point to that guy down there. Okay, so the rules for forming the DAG, clear? Great, okay. Okay, and then, so how are we going to extract this total order? Uh, well, we don't have to use the notion of leader blocks, but it's sort of a fairly sort of uh, natural way to proceed. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to use a notion of leader blocks. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to divide all the, the rounds into waves. Okay, so basically each wave will consist of five rounds. Okay, so wave one is one rounds one, two, three, four, five. Wave two is six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. Okay, with that, okay, so we're dividing it into waves. Each wave consists of five rounds. And then, okay, for the first round of each wave, we're going to select a leader. Okay, so in round one, we'll select a leader. Round six, we'll select a leader. And round 11, we'll select a leader, and so on, yeah? Okay. And then blocks produced by the leader, like in that round, they'll be called leader blocks. Okay, so if I'm the leader for round one, I produce a block in round one, that, that, that'll be called a leader block. Okay, is that crystal clear? Yeah. Waves consist of five rounds. So, uh, so with an honest leader, you'll have one leader block. With a dishonest leader, you may have Yeah, so the leader block, yeah. Okay, so here, uh, I'm not going to, I don't need to worry yet about, like, how we're selecting the leader for each round. Okay, at the back of our minds here, we know that now we are going to come up against the FLP impossibility results. We know we are going to have to use some randoms at some point. Okay, and it's, it's in choosing the leaders that the randoms is going to come in. Okay, so you can have that at the back of your mind if you like. But for now, I don't want you to worry about how the leaders are selected. Okay, but just, there are leaders somehow, okay? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll we'll get safety without. Yeah. It, it's it's for the liveness that we need the randomness. Okay, so yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. We could we could we could choose leaders deterministically and be safe, but we we, we want liveness. Okay, okay. Okay, so is that all crystal clear? Great. Okay. Okay, and as we, as we were just saying before. Okay, so. It's hopefully fairly easy to see. I mean, it's, it's quite easy to extend any DAG structure to a, uh, a total order, okay, uh, if you're not worried about things like safety conditions and things, okay, right? So we can assume given that we're given some function tau, which takes any DAG and extends it to a, a total ordering. 
Okay, so we're going to assume given a tower of that, of that sort, and that will just be a tool that we're going to use. Doesn't yet suffice, right? Because it doesn't have the required safety safety condition. Okay, if people just use this tower, they're going to be producing these backward sequences. Okay, but it's going to be a, a tool that we can use. Okay. Okay, a little bit of notation. Okay, so for block U, so square brackets U, that just that's the initial segment of the DAG defined by U, like the below U. Okay. All the stuff that you observe. Okay, so first of all, then, so the, the rough idea is this. Okay, so here I'm being a little bit vague at first, and I'll, I'll make it more precise later on. Okay, so for some sort of like commonly agreed sequence of leader blocks, whatever that means, I'm gonna have to make that precise. Okay, we for some commonly agreed sequence of leader blocks, like U1, U2, U3, and so on, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define the total ordering to be, so tau of U1, okay, and then concatenated with tau of this remainder here, like the stuff that U2 observes that isn't already observed by U1, concatenated with this remainder here, concatenated with this remainder here, and so on. Okay, that's what we're going to end up doing. And hopefully it's clear on some sort of basic intuitive level, obviously I'm, I'm being vague at this point, but if there really is some sort of commonly agreed sequence of the leader blocks, then this should sort of be okay, right? So that's the rough picture. Okay, we want to we form some sort of commonly agreed sequence of leader blocks, and then we're going to, we're going to form the total ordering in, in this sort of way. Uh, it's obvious here, though, that we, we can't just like, use any sequence of leader blocks, right? Because you know, people might sort of disagree on them. Uh, malicious actors might produce you know, equivocating pairs of leader blocks and so on. Okay? So the blocks we use will have to be confirmed or final in some sense. Okay? So we're going to need some sort of notion of finality here. Uh, yes, well, certainly if, yes, if all the leader blocks were honest, it'd be, I guess. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so to recap then, so the idea so far is we're okay, dividing the sets of rounds into waves, each wave is five rounds. We somehow select a leader for, the, the leader for the first round of each wave, and we call it their blocks in that round, uh, leader blocks. Okay. Uh, and the idea is that if we can agree on a sequence of leader blocks, then that sequence could be used, as I guess described, to find the, requ to find the required total order. Okay? And what we said just before is that to, to agree on the, on, the, on, the, on the sequence, obviously we'll need to find some notion of finality for leader blocks, okay? so that everyone can agree on which, which, which blocks are final. Okay, so now what we're going to do is define... Okay. Just because, like, everybody eventually agrees on the initial segment, and then everybody eventually agrees on the Yeah, you're, you're just totally ordering stuff, so you're, 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 you're meeting the SMR requirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what I guess said there is that we, we need to establish a notion of finality for, for, for leader blocks, so everyone agree on the, the right sort of sequence to use, right? So just a couple of definitions. Again, I apologize for the number of definitions. It's not my fault. <laughs> okay, so by a supermajority of blocks, Right, we mean a, a set of blocks produced by a supermajority of miners or validators or whatever they call them. Okay? So take the set of blocks, take the set of miners who produced at least one of those, that's a supermajority. Okay, okay uh, and now we're going to say a block V is ratified by a block U if U observes a supermajority of blocks approving V. So maybe a little time to sort of absorb, absorb that. If, if, if you're familiar with Tendermint, then one way you could think of this, you can sort of think of this as being, think of you as seeing a stage. So in Tendermint, you have like two rounds of voting in each block, right? You might get in the first round, you might get a stage one QC or call them a certificate in stage two, you might get a stage two QC, okay? Here you could think of you as like seeing a stage one QC for V, right? Because each of these blocks that is, is approving V, you can think of that as being a vote for V. Okay, so U is seeing like a stage one QC. So you can think of, when, when you see a stage one QC, you, you, you vote for it. So you can think of U as representing like a stage two vote in the, in the tender setting. Okay? 
If, if you're familiar with Tendermint, that's helpful. If you're not, it's unhelpful. In that case, forget what I just said. Just take, the, just take it at face value, okay? <laughs> okay, and then we're going to say a leader block of wave W is final if it's ratified by a supermajority of blocks in the final round of the wave. Okay, and again, for those who know Tenderbent, this is like V receiving a stage two QC, right? Each of those, the, the, each of those blocks that ratifies it, that's like a stage two vote. Now we've got a, a, a supermajority of those, so we've got our stage two QC. Okay, and again, that's hopefully a helpful way to think about it if you know Tenderbent. If you don't, then just take those definitions at, 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 at face value. Okay, so I guess, yeah, it's sort of helpful if you can try and remember those definitions for what, what's going to follow, okay? Everybody happy? Okay, so we said we needed a, a notion of finality. Okay, and now, we, now we've got that, that, that notion. We can go back and we can make our previous, I, I sort of outlined how we're going to define our, our total ordering. Okay, but now we can make that precise using the, uh, the notion of finality we defined. Okay, so at any given point in the, in the execution, each, each party is going to have some DAG structure. They want to extract some sort of, sort of total ordering from that. Okay, so what we're doing is we're defining a function ORD, which will take any DAG structure, which you're thinking of being the DAG structure that a party might have at a given point in the execution. Okay, and it's going to output some totally ordered sequence of, of, of blocks. Okay, and what we said before is basically it's going to suffice to select a, an appropriate sequence of leader blocks. Okay, appropriate in some sense. So all we have to specify now is precisely how we define that sequence. Okay, then we'll have defined order. So the way we define that sequence is as follows. What we do, we take D, we take the last final leader block in D. That's this guy here. Okay, we take the last final leader block in D. Let's call that guy U. Okay, and then, so that's that, this guy here. And then we ask, well, what, what's the, the last leader block uh, in D that's ratified by U? Not necessarily final, but what's the last leader block that's ratified by you? That's this guy here. Okay, so that's U prime. And then we ask, what's the last leader block ratified by U prime? That's this guy here. Call that U double prime. Okay, we keep on iterating. And that's how we define our sequence. Okay, so again, so the way you define the sequence, we just take the last final leader block. Okay, that's U. Let me ask, what's the last leader block ratified by you? That's this guy. What's the last leader block ratified by that one? That's the next guy, and so on. And we iterate in that fashion to define our sequence. Okay, and then again, so once we've got this sequence, u1, u2, u3, and so on, right, our output is just tau of the stuff below u1 concatenated with tau of the stuff in the remainder concatenated with tau of the stuff in the remainder there, okay? So that's just a definition. It shouldn't be clear yet why that works, okay? But at this point, it's important that the definition is clear. Okay. Right, so, okay, so here again, again, it won't be clear so why this is the right definition yet, but it's just a definition. So we, we take the, the last final leader block in the DAG. Okay, so these okay. are like round 16 or something. Like yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 these are finalized. Okay, and then we look at what's the last leader block ratified by that one. So it could be the previous one or it could be an earlier one. Which may or may not be final. Which may or may not be final, right? Okay. Okay, and then we just keep on iterating. What's the last leader block? ratified by that one. This is the last leader block ratified by that one, and so on. Okay, we keep on iterating back. That defines our sequence. Then we feed it into town. We get our, 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 our order. So, so maybe it's, you should answer this later, but I am curious, why not just use the final leader blocks and not worry about this kind of iteration that you're doing? Okay. Yes, yeah, uh, okay. Because that seems like the first thing to try, right? Okay, well certainly we'll see a proof that works, and maybe because we'll think about what will happen if that's there. We do that as well, okay, fine, okay, okay. 
So there's some leader in some round who points to none, right? Like, like, he, can't, he can't do that. So you, you, won't, you won't regard him as being a, a you will ignore the block unless he points to like a, a super majority in the previous round, right? Got it. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so shall we move on at this point? Are we happy with the, the basic definition? I say, uh, so now basically all we've done so far is we've defined how we extract the total ordering. Right? So now what we've got to do is we've got to prove safety and we've got to prove liveness. Okay, so let's let's see safety first. Sorry, I'm trying to I still want to understand the proof a little bit. So like you start from a block that's finite, mm. then you look at the most recent one that they ratify. Yeah. Then you must look at the most recent one that that one ratifies. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, <clears throat> so basically from this point, it's, it's going to be pretty easy to prove safety if we have the following lemma, and the following lemma will be pretty easy to prove, okay? <clears throat> so the, the, the following lemma says, okay, if a leader block is final, then in fact it's ratified by every subsequent leader block. Okay, so being final means that you're ratified you've got a, you know, by a super majority in the, in the final round of that wave already. This just says, okay, actually the, the next leader will also ratify you, and the leader after that will also ratify you, and so on, okay? Okay, so that's a lemma. It's quite an easy lemma. We'll, we'll see proof of that in a, in a second. But first of all, I just want to like, assume that lemma is true and see why it quickly leads to safety. Okay, okay well, what do we have to prove to prove safety? Basically, what we've got to prove is this. So if D1 and D2 are two DAGs held by honest parties P1 and P2, maybe at the same time, maybe different times. Okay, then ORD D1, the total ordering you know, that corresponds to D1, and the total ordering that corresponds to D2, Right, these are consistent. Right, one is an initial segment of another, of the other. Right, that's what we want to prove for safety. Happy with that? Cool. Okay, and the next point. So we, we want to prove that. The next observation is, well, it suffices to show that the sort of total ordering corresponding to D1 is an initial segment of the total ordering corresponding to D1 union D2. And the total ordering corresponding to D2 is also an initial segment of the total ordering corresponding to D1 d of the union, right? Because if they're both initial segments of this common string, then they have to be compatible. Okay? So in general, then, it suffices to show that if you've got one DAG held by one user and another DAG held by another user that could be held by another user, which, and, the, and the first one is a, super, is a subset of the second one, then the total ordering corresponding to the first one is an uh, initial segment the total ordering corresponding to the second one. Okay, so in general, it's, it's fine to consider the case that D1 is a, is a, is a, a subset of D2. Okay, that's slightly confusing notation because I'm using sort of D2 in different ways there, but okay. Okay, we're happy with that? Okay, so we just have to show that if, if one DAG is held by one user and a second DAG is held by another user and, and that, that second DAG is a superset of the first, and the corresponding uh, total order is, uh, is, is an extension of the, the, the total order for the, for the first smaller set. Okay. okay, so let's consider that case. Okay, let's suppose D1 is a subset of D2, right? And now we want to show that the, the corresponding total orders are, are, are consistent with each other. Okay, so we'll consider the case. So first of all, if D1 has no final leader, okay, then the, the total order corresponding to it is just the empty sequence. Okay, so then we're done because that's compatible with everything. Okay, so suppose otherwise, suppose the last final leader block in D1 is, is just this node here, U. Okay? So then how do we form the total ordering on D2? Well, we take the last final leader in D2, this guy is up, this guy up here, right? And then we go to the last final leader ratified by that one, the last final leader ratified by that one, and so on. And what we need to be true is at some point in the sequence we're going to hit this node U, right? We can't go past the node U. But that follows just directly from the lemma we previously stated, because we said if, if U is a final leader block, then it's ratified by all subsequent leader blocks. Okay, so this node here will be ratified by all these guys. Okay, so we can't go past U in the ordering, okay, in, the, in the sequence. Because that means the total ordering corresponding to D2 will just be the total ordering corresponding to D1 concatenated with the tower of these guys, concatenated with the tower of these guys, concatenated with the tower of those guys, and so on. Okay? So it's an extension of the total ordering. Uh, corresponding to D1. 
because it could be the same thing, right? But it's, it's slightly compatible. Happy with that? Shall I stand up for it? Yeah. Uh, well, you, in the liveness proof, we're going to leave wave to be uh, five rounds long. Yeah, so far, we're not using the other rounds in the wave at all, really, right? But you, we're going to need five rounds in the, in the wave in order to make sure that you, you, yeah, you, the, the liveness happens. Okay. I'm going on, yeah. Okay. Okay, so that all works. Um, but we assume this basic level, right? So if a leader block is final, then it's ratified by every subsequent leader block. Okay, so let's just quickly prove that. This is kind of easy. We can do this just by a, a proof by picture. Okay, there are <coughs> so two cases to consider here. This is the first case and the second. So the first case is, so this is a, a final uh, leader block here, okay? And the first case is we're considering a leader for the next round. I'm sorry, the, the first round of the next wave, right? Okay. So this is the final leader block here. So what does this picture mean? So here we have, this is the final round of the, of the wave. Right? And all these guys are ratifying this guy here because each one of these can observe some supermajority of blocks approving it. Okay, these supermajorities aren't all necessarily the same. It just kind of looks like they are in the picture, but it's hard to draw a picture properly, right? Okay, so, so here, this is the final round of the wave. Each of these guys ratifies this, right? So they're each observing a supermajority of blocks that uh, approves that. Okay. So the first case is that the, the next leader we're considering is the one that the, for the, the first round of the next wave. Okay, in that case, this guy here has to acknowledge a supermajority. Well, that's the rules of forming the DAG. Okay. That supermajority and this one have to have some honest node in the intersection. Okay. But then this guy is observing a, a supermajority of blocks approving him, so, so is he. Okay, so in that case, he also ratifies the block. And then, okay, the other case is basically the same. Okay, now we're considering it's not, it's not necessarily the, <coughs> the first wave round of the next wave, it's some later wave. So it's basically the same argument. So here we have a leader block here. They have to approve, uh, acknowledge, directly acknowledge some supermajority of nodes. Again, this supermajority and this supermajority have to have some honest node in the intersection. This honest nodes block here, if it's the same honest node, right? This one has to observe this one. So again, this guy still observes the supermajority of nodes uh, approving the. Okay, so in both cases, it's quite a, sort of a simple observation there. Okay, so we have uh, <coughs> security. Okay, so now we're almost at the end of the fiddly bit of the talk. It's getting easier in a little bit. Yeah, so I, I yeah, so is that, that I knew you were going to ask that question, I thought that was, <laughs> uh, I guess it's an obvious question, I mean, okay, I guess when I was given the analogy of the first, it was mainly just to help me sort of think about remembering the definition, how precise the analogy is, I'm not sure, it's worth thinking about, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. It's like in Penniman you would say, it would never exist to the stage two QC, yeah. or yeah. lifting blocks. I mean, if, yeah. Here, it's something slightly different going on, because in Tendermint you're using locks and that kind of stuff, and I don't think quite the same stuff is happening here. So I, I yeah, I, I thought about it a bit, but maybe it's worth thinking about more. Yeah, all right, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so we've done um, security. Now we guess I have to show liveness. This part I'm going to sort of just give some sort of sketch a bit more. I'm not going to full proof. Okay, so first of all, for liveness, it suffices, it suffices to show, if it's pretty clear, the existence of infinitely many honest final leader blocks. Okay, because if I produce a block and I send it out, then eventually it will be delivered, right, to the, all the honest parties, right? So they will, they will be producing blocks that observe it. Okay, so it's, it's going to be incorporated into our total order as long as they're producing infinite many final leader blocks. Okay, so that's our task. Okay, now that we come up against this, this problem that we're going to need randomness in the asynchronous setting. Okay, so what happens, so if, if we don't proceed in a random fashion, we don't use any randomness, let's suppose we just announce ahead of time that so P3 is going to be the leader at the beginning of the wave. Well, then what the adversary can do is they, they can just delay messages from P3. Right, and as the honest parties, we don't know. So maybe P3 is just a dishonest party. Maybe they're never going to send any messages. Right, we don't know whether the message has been delayed and they're honest or maybe they're dishonest. So we can't wait forever. Eventually we have to go on with something else and we have to add some other stuff into our, into our total ordering and then, okay, so, so it won't work. 
Okay, so this won't work. So what we can do instead, though, is let's suppose we don't elect a leader initially. Okay. What we do is just like, allow people to keep them forming a DAG in a standard fashion. And if we do that, what we'll find is that we end up with a supermajority of blocks from the first round of the wave down here, uh, which are ratified by all blocks in the final round of the wave. Yeah, that would just sort of happen by some sort of combinatorial argument that isn't that fiddly, but which I'm sweeping under the rug slightly. Okay? Okay? So then what we can do is we can toss our, our, our global coin okay, in order to retrospectively select which guy's a leader for this wave. Okay, and we have a, like a, a more than two-thirds chance of, of, of selecting one that is, uh, has actually you know, produced a final, final block for that wave. Yeah, you didn't even know who the leader was, right? So you, 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 just, you, just, you, you just proceeded. And the way the DAG structure formed, you just get a lot of blocks down here being ratified by a lot of blocks up here. And so then you just randomly choose a leader and it has a good chance of working out and producing a final. Yeah, uh, but that's why you can follow the leader is a little bit misleading terminology. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want to give a better name. Yeah, so here we've got K is five. I mean, it's a little bit sort of fiddly. So here K is five for cordial minors for Dag Rider, which we'll see in a bit K is four. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those arguments. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not actually that hard, but it's maybe a bit sort of fiddly for, for talk. You sort of do it from like truth table, you count the number of ones and stuff like that. Huh? Is two No. Three? <laughs> well, <laughs> you need, okay, for, for, for this one, okay, so let's, let's say for Dag Rider you need four. But you can sort of cheat by overlapping the last round of this one and the, fir the, the first round of the next ones. You can bring it down to three, okay? But the, basically, there's some sort of arguments seem to be quite straightforward. Sort of okay, so that was cordial minors. Yeah, so at this point, basically, most of the, the hard work is done. Hopefully, it'll be sort of, uh, easier from this point, okay? So now let's look at Dag Rider, okay? So this is, uh, I'm going to say, you know, it's, it's pretty similar. But now we're going to deal with the possibility of equivocating blocks in a different way. So previously we allowed equivocating blocks, they were added to the DAG and then we had to sort of deal with them. Now basically we're going to just prevent equivocating blocks from being added to the DAG in the first place. Okay, and we're going to do, do that using what's called reliable broadcast. Okay, so let's look at reliable broadcast first. Okay, so as we were sort of talking about a little bit earlier on, so basically reliable broadcast, you can think of it as being like a relaxation of Byzantine broadcast where you weaken the termination condition. Okay, the difficulty with Byzantine broadcast in an asynchronous setting is you're forced to terminate even if the broadcaster says nothing. Okay, that's obviously just impossible, because if the broadcaster said nothing, you don't know, are they honest? Are they just waiting for their messages? I've got to terminate now, or are they just dishonest, and so on, okay? Okay, so we weaken the, the termination requirement. Okay, so again, just to define the problem, so that the setup is that one party is designated the, the broadcaster, and they're given some input. Okay, and then the requirements are, are as follows. So first of all, we have like a, an agreement requirement, okay, which says, if any honest party terminates, then they must all terminate with the same output in V. Okay, but that's allowing that maybe none of them terminate, right? especially if the, if the leader is dishonest and they're sending no messages whatsoever, you're allowed not to terminate. Okay, so that's the, the agreement requirement. And then we have a validity requirement which says, okay, but if the, if the broadcaster is honest, then all honest parties have to terminate giving their, their input as their output. Okay, we have the definition. So it's essentially like Byzantine broadcast, but we've weakened the termination condition to, to say in particular, okay, so if, if, the, if the broadcast is dishonest, then we, you don't have to terminate. Okay. But if any honest party does, then you will do have to, okay? Yeah, point, but in some sense, like, as a node, you should be thinking, I'm only going to terminate if I convince myself that others will eventually terminate, other yeah. honest parties. But it doesn't yes. mean that Okay, so this is what I'm going to show you is the sort of simplest version of this. This is Bracker's broadcast. It's a very nice, elegant sort of protocol. Again, this works in the asynchronous setting. It's entirely deterministic, etc. Okay, uh, and then there are more sophisticated versions that are more efficient and stuff, but this is a very nice, simple one. Okay, so initially, unsurprising, the, the broadcaster sends their value to all. Obviously, if they're honest, they'll send a single value. If they're dishonest, they might send multiple values. Okay. 
Okay, and then there are three circumstances in which any, any party speaks after that. Okay, so first of all, when P receives the first value from the broadcaster, they echo that value. Okay, they send a message, echo V, to all parties. Okay, so hopefully that's not too surprising. Okay, you receive that value, you get to echo it to everybody. Okay. Okay, second circumstance in which you speak. Okay, if P receives echo V messages from N minus F, distinct parties, and it hasn't yet voted, then P votes for V by sending like, a vote for V out to all parties. Okay, you see N minus F echoes all for the same value, then you vote for that value. So, so far, what we've achieved basically is that honest parties can't vote for different values. Right? If you're voting for two different values, that corresponds to, to, to like two different sets of N minus F echo messages, right? The two sets of N minus F parties must have an honest party in the inter interception, right, who can't echo two values. Okay, so so far what we've achieved is, you know, honest parties can't vote for two distinct values. And from there, okay, it's going to be easy to ensure different honest parties can't decide different values. Okay, so we're in a strong position so far for that. Okay, and the last condition on which someone speaks is, so if P receives vote V messages from F plus one distinct parties, right, and if it hasn't yet voted, okay, then P also votes for V by sending a vote V message to all parties. Okay, and the point of that is to ensure that, so if any honest party decides V, okay, basically you're going to decide V, I haven't written it down yet, but I wouldn't have it, you'll decide V when you see N minus F votes for V. Right? So if any honest party decides V, that's because they've seen N minus F votes for V. That means all parties have seen N minus 2F votes for V, which means they've seen F plus 1 votes for V, which means that all honest parties will vote, which means that all honest parties will terminate. Okay, well, okay. okay, we'll go through that again a little bit. Okay, okay and then the, the determination uh, <coughs> uh, is specified just as I you know, previously said. So an honest party decides V if it receives vote V messages from N minus F distinct parties. Okay, so let's prove that works. Okay, so I've just made it smaller and put it inside my box there. Uh, okay, so, so first of all, I right, want to show, just we're saying the same thing we observed before, so honest parties can't vote for different values. Suppose uh, they do, right, so suppose P is the first honest party for vote for V, and that P prime is the first honest party to vote for some different value, V prime not equal to V. Okay, in that case, each of these must receive echo V messages from N minus F distinct parties, right? If you're the first one to vote for a value, it has to be for this first reason here. It can't be for this reason, because this requires there to be F plus one votes already. At least one of them has to be honest, right? So if you're, if you're the first person to vote, it has to be uh, for this reason here, right? Okay? So then P receives echo V messages from N minus F distinct parties. P prime receives echo V, mes v prime messages from N minus F distinct parties. But then those two sets of N minus F parties, they must have an honest party in the intersection, right? And that's a contradiction, because they couldn't vote for, they couldn't echo both values. Okay. So that's just what we said before. So honest parties can't vote for different values. Uh, and then what do we have to show? Well, we have to show that if the broadcaster's honest, then nobody's going to sort of terminate with their, their input value as their output. Okay, but here that's easy, right? Because if the broadcaster's honest, then they're going to send the same value to everybody, everyone's going to echo that value, and then everybody's going to vote for that value, and they'll all decide on that value, right? You just Right, hopefully that, that's, that's clear from the protocol. Right, they'll send it out. Everybody will echo that, so they'll all see M minus F uh, echoes of the exact value, so they'll all then vote for it. So they'll all see M minus F votes. Right, you could vote this way or that way, depending on what you see first, but either way, everyone will vote for it. All the honest parties will vote for it, right? Okay, so that case is, is easy enough. And the last thing we have to show is the, the agreement property. Okay, so now suppose an honest party decides V, well then, that means they receive N minus F votes for V, right? So that means all parties receive at least N minus 2F votes for V, yeah? Okay, but we're assuming F is less than N over 3, so that means that we, they all receive F plus 1 distinct uh, uh, votes, right? Okay, so that means all honest parties are going to vote for V, either through this first mechanism or through the second mechanism, right? And also because they can't have already voted for other values. Right? So all honest parties will vote for V, so they'll all decide for V. Okay, 
Okay, so again, I think that's quite a very sort of elegant, slick uh, photo bar there. It's very nice. Okay, uh, and again, note this is a simple deterministic protocol which works in the asynchronous setting. Okay, and in fact, and you might think it's interesting or it's maybe you don't think it is, it doesn't even require PKI if we have authenticated channels. Okay. Okay, so now back to Dag Ryder. Uh, so basically, the protocol works very similarly to, to cordial miners, the protocol we were defi be describing before. Okay, but now we're going to deal with the creating blocks differently. Right? Rather than allowing them to be added to the Dag, we're just going to stop them being added to the Dag. We're going to say for each round, each party has to go through some like, reliable broadcast. Right? So either everyone will decide like on a, a same like, one, one, one value for them or none. So you can't you can't produce equivocating blocks. Okay, so what's the outcome of this? So this allows you to reduce um, the number of rounds in each wave by one. Okay, the cost is that rather than just allowing people to add directly, you know, blocks in directly, you have to go through this, this broadcast protocol, right? So that's, that's uh, adding to the latency. Right, and then we've got the various rounds of the broadcast protocol to go, to go through for each block. Um, an advantage is, so I described Bracker's broadcast there, which is very simple. We, we can do some more efficient things, clever things. It can be used... Okay, so, uh, yeah, but then we can, we can use efficient versions of reliable broadcast, I'm going to describe. They could be used to make the expected amortized communication complexity per transaction order N for DAG rider. Okay, so order N is the best you can possibly do per transaction because it at least has to be like sent to all parties. But there is a bit of sort of cheat going on here because basically the way you achieve this is through some other techniques and through batching. So batching means you basically stick lots and lots of transactions into each block in order to like uh, hide the, the communication costs slightly of the, of the consensus, okay? So in order to achieve that, it's not that bad. You have to add, add n log n many transactions into each block. Maybe that's bad, okay? In some other protocols, like, like Honey Badger, it's like n squared log n or something, so maybe then it's, it's uh, more of a cheat. Okay, so now uh, let's start thinking about uh, so our DAG protocol is actually good. Right? How do they compare with your you know, monolithic protocols where everything's in a, in a row? Uh, okay, so first of all, I'm going to look at communication complexity. I'm going to preface this by saying I don't think communication complexity is a very good way of comparing how protocols are efficient, basically. I mean, I, like, it's, it's the standard way it's done in the distributed computing literature, but I don't think it's a particularly uh, good measure. Okay, but anyway, because it's the standard way, we'll go through that first. Okay, um, okay so so far, we've been looking at the asynchronous setting. So let's stay there for a little bit. Okay, I was going to say later on though, I mean, you, so we focused on the asynchronous setting. You can, of course, you can define DAG protocols which are specialized to work in the partially synchronous or the synchronous setting or, or whatever, yeah? Okay. Okay, so let's start comparing with uh, some non-DAG protocols uh, in the asynchronous setting, first of all. Um, and in particular, let's think about, so Weber is basically a modification of hot stuff which works in the asynchronous setting. Okay, hot stuff is, is designed to work in the partially synchronous setting. Uh, right, where message delivery has like uh, good periods and bad periods. Right? You're only required to make progress when you have good communication. Uh, okay, but if we, we, we can sort of modify hot stuff quite easily to work in the asynchronous setting. Um, <coughs> so how do we do that? Well, basically, we have, we have the sort of same threat to liveness as we had before. Right? So if we just select a leader in advance, I right, suppose we, we, we produce sort of K blocks, we now want to produce the K plus first block. If we just select this guy is going to be leader in advance, well, then the university can just delay their messages. Again, it's the same thing, right? So as the honest guys, we don't know is the leader honest and their message has been delayed or they're dishonest so they're never going to produce anything. So eventually we'll have to move on, okay? So that doesn't work. So what we do is something sort of similar. So what we do is we run N instances of hot stuff from a three-phase protocol for the next block simultaneously. Yeah? N simultaneously, right? Each party like acting as a leader once, right, for one of those, yeah? And then what we can do is we wait for N minus F of those to complete, right? That eventually has to happen, okay? And then, same sort of trick as before, we randomly select a leader, right? And if they produce a confirmed block, then we use that one. And we just discard the rest. It seems extremely wasteful. No, 
line and line. No, okay. I, I, it's true. I, I'm, I'm using hot stuff rather than tendermint because the, the, the instructions are in hot stuff of the, of the sort. Wait for n minus f, then do this. Wait for n minus f, then this. Whereas, whereas, whereas tendermint relies on timeouts and stuff, which, which won't work in a second second. Okay, so hopefully that's sort of basically clear how we can get it to work in the asynchronous setting. Okay, so what's the communication complexity there? Well, so for each instance, it's order n. We've got n of them, so that's order n squared. We're imagining our blocks are of, of constant size here. Okay, so this is order n squared expected, commu expected communication complexity per confirmed contraction now, because it's expected, because now we've got randoms involved and stuff, right? Okay. Okay. So what happens is that why, why is the randomness affected? Well, I mean... It could be that oh, you never produce anything, like, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, so that gives you n squared, but okay, then there are things you can do with like batching, including more transactions and blocks and some other type of clever tricks. So Dumbo is a modification of Weber, the protocol we just talked about, which modifies that using batching and some other tricks. It gives you order n expected like amortized communication complexity per confirmed transaction. Okay, so again, you can get to the optimal case. Right, so order again, as I said here, is optimal because each transaction has to at least be sent to the end different parties, right? So you can get to the optimal case as long as you are, you're happy to accept this, this batching. Okay, which again, th there is a trade-off there because that, that can increase your latency, right? It depends how fast transactions are coming in. So if you have to wait for like n log n transactions or n squared log n or whatever, then that can, that can slow things down. Okay, so cordial miners, we've got order n squared, expected amortized communication complexity per transaction uh, using batching. And again, using some sort of like slick, reliable broadcast protocol for DAG Rider, I think your order N, expected amortized communication complexity per, trans per transaction. Um, <clears throat> a slight sort of complication here is we, we, we haven't worried yet about, so in a DAG structure, if you've got uh, an actual situation where all the clients are sending in their transactions, uh, right, they, 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 but they're presumably going to want to send those to transactions to multiple sort of miners, multiple validators, right? In order that we, we can't censor them. So then you'll, there's a danger of having like repetition of transactions, right? So you, you, in order to get, uh, in order to make these calculations, we're basically ignoring transaction repetition here. Okay, so there's a slight sort of complexity there, but you can get around that by sort of randomly sampling which, which transactions you're using and that kind of stuff. Okay, but that, that isn't specified in these protocols. It is specified in Honey Badger, for example, but it's, it's not worried about here. Okay, so that was for the asynchronous setting. Uh, how about for the partially synchronous setting? Okay, so bull shark is basically, it's like, a, it's like DAG Rider, but it's sort of optimized in some way to work for the, the partially synchronous setting. Okay, what do we find here? So again, if we're looking at hot stuff, uh, so hot stuff has sort of like order n complexity within views. I guess at this point, I'm kind of assuming you're in hot stuff for a bit, sorry about that. Okay, so hot stuff has like order n complexity within views. It doesn't tell you how to efficiently manage your view changes. Uh, so you use my protocol, so Fever, that gives you like 2n uh, uh, messages per view change. Okay, so if you, if you use that combined with hot stuff, then what do you get? So here then you have order n communication complexity when network conditions are good and all parties are honest. So that's like under good conditions. Okay, but so now it's not expected order n, it's not amortized order n, it's just order n right, per, per, transa per transaction. Okay. You have order n amortized communication complexity when network conditions are good. You have Byzantine uh, 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 parties. So the amortization is over what? Yeah, so you might have like f many 40 leaders in a row. But uh, yeah, so you're just sort of averaging okay. out over on yeah. okay. okay, and you get order n squared communication cost uh, in the worst case, right, to produce a confirmed block when network conditions are good and with Byzantine adversaries. So order n squared to produce a confirmed block in the worst case. If you go to Bullshock, okay, we're, we're missing out this case. We're going straight to the amortized version. So we get the amortized version again, okay, order in amortized cost. Um, but then when you look at like the, the worst case cost to produce a confirmed block, now it, this looks massive, right? So the worst case, we've got to like order n to the four log n communication cost to produce a confirmed block in the worst case, right, when network conditions are good, but with Byzantine adversaries. But the point here is in that worst case, when you, when you do finally confirm a block, well, then confirming loads of blocks, right? Everything below that, right? Okay. 
Okay, so what's the uh, basic picture there? I guess maybe that's the sound of it. The overall picture is that so far, DAG protocols are basically, well, they're all sort of pretty similar. They're all sort of, you can get pretty close to optimal. If you're not worried about like batching, uh, if you're not worried about uh, latency, other stuff, okay, but you can get sort of pretty close to optimal. It's pretty close so far. Okay, but obviously communication complexity isn't really what we care about, right? What we really care about is... Why is it better? Yeah. Huh? You're asking why is it better than the, the other guy? I'm yeah. trying to like so. Was the second bullet on a bull shark? Like, does that? How does that compare to? Like, how does that compare to the other DAG based protocols we've been talking? About? So in the other ones, we, we were in asynchronous settings, so there's no worst case, right? So this this line here disappears. So here we're really talking about this. It's deterministic now, so we have a worst case. And the, the optimization of bull shark isn't really to change these figures. Well, except that you don't. Know, this figure exists. Right. The worst case. Yes. The, uh, yeah. Other ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, what if, like, you could try to evaluate those protocols in the partial distributed model, right? And ask about. Yes. Conditions. Right. So then it will be, uh, you'll get the same figure then if you make it deterministic. Okay. So the okay. basically the difference with bull shock is working very similarly to DAG, but you, you manage to reduce the latency. So now we don't need the four, four rounds. Now we only need two. So the argument for liveness changes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just trying to. So that figure will be the same. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I guess there are quite a lot of figures here, but the basic picture so far is okay, maybe it's sort of fairly similar for the, for the, for the DAG and the non DAG structures. Okay, but what we really care about is latency and throughput, right? And I'm saying, I, I, basically, there aren't really the, the prevailing methods in distributed computing, just consider your, the main thing is to look at your communication complexity. Okay, so it's, it's difficult to analyze these things in a rigorous way. So basically, what we have to do is just like, uh, you know, run experiments, okay, and then. When you're running your experiments, of course, you have to make sure we really are comparing apples to apples, right? We mean the same thing by transaction. We have the same internet connection speeds. We have the same processes and so on, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, as an example, this is the team behind Bullshark compared the performance of Bullshark. So Tusk is basically, it's like DAG Rider, just with some optimizations involved, okay? So just think of that as like a slightly optimized version of DAG Rider. No, 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 okay, so DAG, DAG Rider works in the asynchronous setting. As does Tusk. As does Tusk, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, uh, and we and hot stuff as well, okay. And what they found, so the following is under good network conditions. We're not, here everybody's behaving nicely, right, uh, our network connection is, is, is always good and so on, running as fast as possible. Okay, so for hot stuff, you get 50,000 transactions a second for 20 parties, uh, 30,000 transactions for 50 parties, I mean, a latency of around two seconds. This is all honest, though? This is all, everybody just being good, yeah? All, everybody's being honest. Okay, we're not exploring how bad it goes when people are, are, are naughty. For Tusk, we get up to 160,000 transactions a second for 20 or 50 parties. I'm not sure why it's exactly the same. I mean, yeah, somehow the network wasn't saturated for um, yeah, more than 20. Uh, but now, okay, the, the latency is slightly, slightly larger. Okay, and for bull shark, we're getting 130,000 transactions a second for 50 parties, a latency around two seconds. Okay, I don't know why they didn't get the figure for 20 parties there, I'm not sure, okay, no, that's, that's the figure they get. Okay, so I, I don't know to what extent you can take those as being like gospel. <laughs> uh, maybe you know, one of them is coded in better than the other one, I don't know, okay, but anyway, so it seems to be the case that the, the, the DAG protocols are being pretty efficient. Uh, I don't think those were included in the party. I don't want to promise. Uh, sorry, they were included in the paper. Uh, I, don't know, I can have a look at later on as they are. I'll, I'll look at them later. Okay. I thought these numbers are close enough to each other. Other considerations might be what you need to yeah, decide. Yeah, yeah, go yeah. No, it's just like, I guess from this, my basic takeaway is that they look like they're doing pretty well, but there's nothing definite. Yeah, so here a transaction is just uh, 512 bytes. We don't really care how long it takes to execute it, because all we're doing is we're ordering them. That is like shifting the job of actually executing it to somebody else. Yeah. So they really just quote like a database. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think they're probably doing this because people are just used to talking in terms of, uh, you know, 
transaction rate and transactions per second right now. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so just to finish off with then, okay, so we've mentioned cordial miners, Dag Rider, Bull Shark, Task. Basically, these are these sort of uh, state of the art protocols. Uh, just to go through some, some maybe some older protocols. So, Hedera hash graph, right, this is a permission DAG based protocol. Uh, an issue there is it has exponential expected latency in the, in the presence of Byzantine failures. Okay, so maybe this protocol is like, it's perfectly good when people are being nice, okay, but if, if people start acting badly, then you've got uh, potentially huge latencies there. And basically, the, the reason is that uh, they're not using any global coin. They, everybody just tosses their coins individually. So you're kind of waiting for people to like toss their coin, everybody the same way in the same round before you finally agree, right? So you've got a uh, potentially very inefficient process there. Okay. So I think by this sort of sense in practice, there's a distinction in terms of is it useful to have only one global coin? Uh, well, I don't know if you're happy with setting up a global coin, etc., maybe there are you know, there, there are issues in doing that. I don't know, but uh, I guess. So, again, so in particular, ALEF is a version which basically takes a Hedera hash graph and essentially implements it with a, with a global coin. Okay, so then you cut it down to uh, a constant expected latency. Okay, and you also achieved your, your, sort of your best possible amortized and expected amortized communication complexity if you're happy to accept batching, which you may not, may not be. Okay, then Avalanche also uses a DAG structure for the transactions. When you add a transaction in, right, it has to point to sort of two previous transactions. Okay, and then, sorry, I don't know if you're aware of Avalanche, so what you do then, you decide on conflicting transactions and DAG by repeatedly sampling the opinions of other parties, right? And the, the DAG structure plays a role in that because when you sort of vote for a particular transaction there, you also vote for all the other sort of predecessors in the DAG. Okay, so Avalanche requires synchrony for liveness, uh, and the communication complexity there is order KN, right? Where K is the required number of samples. So that depends on your security parameters and and again, so Avalanche provides a payment system, but no total ordering. And then we have some sort of proof of work protocols, right? So Spectre is a proof of work DAG based protocol. Again, that just provides a payment system, doesn't provide a total ordering. Uh, Tangle is pretty similar to Spectre, but in Spectre, you've got blocks of transactions. In, in Tangle, you're adding them in, in individually. Uh, but okay, so Spectre doesn't provide you with total ordering. So Phantom and Ghost DAG, that's an exten extension of, of Spectre, which does give a total ordering. Uh, Annoy anybody? So <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I mean, uh, no, I, I don't want to go that far. I know. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you.